Greetings and welcome. My name is Dr. Chris Stout. I'm going to be talking on this uh, topic vis-a-vis uh, -vis retirement. Living your life in full, means and methods. When I gave this talk originally, um, it was in front of a live audience. And they somewhat look like this. I asked them about uh, who was in my first living in retirement talk. So uh, I wanted to find out if they were retired full-time or retired part-time or still working or volunteering. And of course, there's uh, opportunities for overlaps amongst all those or just really to even see who just likes to raise their hand in the audience. I'm not a fan of the word retire. Uh, that's why I put it in quotes on that prior slide. I really feel that uh, most folks, if they're able-bodied and smart, like to wake up most days and say, I want to do a good, I want to do good work today. I want to put my brain to work. I want to put my muscles to work and I want to be productive in society. And that's really uh, came from a uh, fellow that I hope to have on my podcast soon. He's agreed to it, but we just don't have a date uh, synced yet named Morgan Housel, who wrote just really a, an influential book on me, for me at least, on uh, the psychology of money. I highly recommend it. And we'll do a lot of talking about books today in this talk, but um, I'll have these, uh, have had these available um, at the conference that I gave at Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin on this topic. So we've done a lot if you're in the retirement phase. We've made it through school, we've raised families, we've created careers, we've helped others, and we're living a life in full. And we probably, uh, most people watching this uh, have done that. Um, and therefore we can take a well-earned victory lap. Uh, but you know what, we're not done yet. This talk has three parts with a uniting theme of being of service to others. Part one will be background and context. Part two will be living your life in full. And part three will give you some ideas and some inspirations uh, if you need them. This presentation will be a sampler, a toolkit, a how-to, idea packed, and I'll offer a few attempts at humor. I'd like to start off with a pop quiz. What is the age range of the Golden Girls? If you remember that television show, I'm guessing you probably do. If you don't, here's a, a shot of um, uh, the cast. So was it 76 and older, 66 to 75, 56 to 65, or 46 to 55? I should play some Jeopardy music or something here. Um, so think about it. I'll give you a hint. It's close to the age of these ladies. You may recognize them from the reboot of Sex and the City. But actually, Carrie and her pals were older uh, in their reboot at ages 54 to 55. The youngest of the Golden Girls cast members was actually 47, so uh, almost a decade younger. Let's take a look at music. Here's Robert Goulet, if you may remember him, at age 35. And here's Lenny Kravitz today at age 50, 58. How about politics? Here's Mamie Eisenhower at age 56. And here's Jill Biden, first lady at age 71. So did you notice? Aging has changed. And so I think retirement should as well too. Getting older used to be thought of somewhat of a train wreck uh, in the later years of our lives, but now, really, today it's more like this. The um, Stanford University did a, uh, a fairly involved uh, study. I won't go into all the details of it. You can get the link uh, here uh, and take a look at it and download it yourself. There's no paywall. It's free. I should also make note that um, all of the, the slides are available. Obviously, uh, you're listening and watching this on YouTube. So uh, all these materials are available uh, through these links. I'll have it in the, the final. So you can always pause on YouTube, uh, but you'll also see it um, this and uh, actually a, a very large uh, group of show notes or a PDF uh, on issue. And I have the link for that in the last slides. But basically, Stanford University um, did this uh, study that they called the new map of life uh, that came out in April. 
2020 and currently this year. Uh, the highlight reel of that is that uh, as we all live longer lives, we will want and need to work longer in either our first career or to do the rewire for an entirely new second career, maybe ages 50 and, or 60. Uh, it's projected that 75 plus year olds in the labor force will grow by 96% in the next 10 years. And that by 2030, all of us boomers will be at least 65 um, and they and older cohorts will represent or we, 9.5% uh, of the workforce, the highest percentage in history. If you're looking to live, so uh, if you're gonna live to be over 90, staying engaged in a new kind of work life will be the key to having a dynamic life. And as I said, there's a lot of books out there. Uh, these are some that I've read and there's others that uh, just kind of didn't even make this cut uh, that informed a lot of the talk and a lot of the presentation that I'll be doing uh, today. Uh, first off, uh, Michael Clinton, who's now become a friend of mine, has a book called Roar. Um, he is also a guest on my podcast, and he is really the guy, the guy that does not like the word uh, retire. And in his vernacular, it's much more uh, rewire. And he talks about different phases of your life, basically by decades, and has a wonderful newsletter that's all free. I'd highly recommend the book and the newsletter and, and listening to our episode. Michael's quite the guy. And also, I had as a guest on my show, uh, Norma Kamali. You may know her if you track fashion. Uh, she was, has been very uh, influential and successful over the last three or four decades. Uh, but take a look at this picture. I'll give you another little pop quiz. Um, Norma, in her new book, I Am Invincible, gives a lot of tips and really uh, kind of uh, walks the talk and practices what she preaches. So um, think about guessing uh, what her age might be. I'll give you two seconds. Norma is 75 uh, and she is just amazing in her work and in her lifestyle. So again, I uh, highly recommend her book. What she has, uh, has it in it as tips and suggestions are uh, very actionable and, and very helpful. So what does it mean to live a life well lived? I'm giving this talk in Sturgeon Bay, so I uh, had an obligation to put a, a boat and some water in. But for me, it's not just about having fun and doing good work or going out on the water. It's also about making a difference in the lives of others and living a life of no regrets, or as I like to say, uh, living a life in full. In my personal experience, joy comes from contribution. It, uh, it's, it's a bias of mine. It's, it's a strong belief that I have, and the point of view throughout this talk is going to be that of uh, uh, being helpful. Uh, others and being having that be part of the fabric of, of this conversation. Uh, I'll start off with telling you a little bit of my story and my work. Um, I have had a fortunate career, been fortunate to have a career of a variety of different kinds of things, doing a variety of uh, academic and applied and things outside of um, uh, the work area as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. And I think maybe one of the things that helped me do that was that basically I started off as Batman. So even if you didn't start off in a bat cave or being a snappy dresser, uh, I think a lot of what we'll talk about today will be of help to you. I'll also use, I'm kind of a car guy, uh, motorcycle guy, uh, gearhead uh, nut, and uh, we'll probably use a lot of uh, road metaphors. Uh, so there's a lot of twists and turns and ups and downs and, and uh, dead ends and scenic routes and whatnot. So for me, that route was, um, I had an academic appointment at the uh, College of Medicine at the University of Illinois for a number of years. It was uh, one of my last academic appointments. And I started off there in the Department of Psychiatry on my uh, doctorate in clinical psychology, and you'll hear more about that too, but um, wound up kind of transfer, uh, transferring over and, and being a, a, a starting advisor in their Center for Global Health, which was really kind of one of the, the key things that uh, I continue to work on today. Prior to that, I had an academic appointment at the College of, or the School of Medicine at uh, the Feinberg School of Medicine at, University, at Northwestern University. And there at Northwestern, I had the opportunity to work with John Lyons very closely and the late Ken Howard and Michael O'Mahony on doing outcome studies. And this is, um, oh my gosh, this is uh, late 80s, early 90s. And there really wasn't a whole lot in the areas of mental health and psychology, psychiatry, looking at at outcomes. Um, outcomes were just really sort of this kind of vague thing. People didn't really exactly know, um, you know, what 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 worked well, and that was one of the things that we really tried to start to pioneer and, and take a close examination of that. 
parallel to those times, it wasn't just all work, I had the fortunate opportunity to be invited to the TED conferences, which you may know about, the Technology, Entertainment, and Design conferences. Uh, TED has now grown. It was originated by Richard Saul Werman. Uh, I had this, again, fortunate opportunity uh, to go to uh, five TEDs that uh, Richard had hosted, uh, TED 5 through 10. And from that time, um, he and I really started to work uh, closely together, became good friends. He's been a supporter of my nonprofit. And he and I worked uh, together, and he with a number of other people, on an edited work called Understanding USA. And in that, it sort of went back to my outcomes and epidemiological kinds of uh, work and data-based kinds of things, looking at prevalence and um, what have you with mental health in the United States. Um, Richard introduced me to Dean Kamen. You may know him. He invented this iBot chair. He uh, builds helicopters. He's quite the kind of the engineer's engineer. He invented the Segway, etc. One of the things you may not know about him, even if you know those things, is that he also uh, started the um, first robotics competition, U.S. first robotics competition. And I was very fortunate to have him invite me to come there and kind of nerd out and be a, a judge at that and get involved kind of again more in the uh, engineering uh, and building kinds of things. I started off before psychology and, and uh, medicine and healthcare uh, as a math major, which was my transition uh, into computer science, because when I started off in the late 70s, there wasn't a Bachelor of Science in computer science, but uh, I was a math major taking Fortran classes. And I realized I really did not want to become a, a, a professional programmer over the course of my career. So I took a psychology class as an undergrad and fell in love with that. After psychology as an undergrad, uh, went to grad graduate school and uh, got my doctorate and uh, did my training and uh, got my license as a clinical psychologist and did some uh, clinical work uh, for about a period of 10 years. From there, then I saw that thinking about those outcomes that I talked about with Northwestern, um, that if you can have technology overlapping with that, which we, we take for granted today, like electronic medical records, that's a really wonderful way of um, collecting data, organizing data, aggregate, aggregating data, and being able to do um, larger scale studies on it. But personally, for me, from a mercenary perspective, I was terrified I was going to misdiagnose someone. Again, my training is psychology, not endocrinology or um, uh, specific medicine per se. So I didn't want someone that had an endocrine disorder, for example, um, to present to me with depression, which is a similar symptom, um, and me to treat them for depression when indeed, when indeed their thyroid was malfunctioning. So I created a very simple, straightforward uh, program to do different, what's called differential psych, psychodiagnostics, to take the symptoms a patient might present to me and sort of sort it between, is this really something that's more biologically based or more psychologically based? And I found in doing that, it wasn't all that difficult. So I started writing about that. You'll see that I really like to write a great deal. So I write, wrote a kind of very meta aspect about this, about writing about uh, what it's like to write a program and being able to teach others to do that. Then that sort of went on with a variety of um, uh, administrative and academic positions and then it brought us to the late 90s. And then the late 90s was the start of more technology startups. And I got involved in the startup areas and working in the, the dot coms before they were while they were booming before their bust. Also around that time, it got me involved uh, to what would become uh, the start of my nonprofit that I still run today called the Center for Global Initiatives. I kept my thumb in the geeky, nerdy world and kept writing. I actually had a publication in uh, IEEE and in some other areas. And again, kind of closing that loop of the circle that was started with looking at outcomes. Once you have a decent enough database and once you can start to draw some conclusions with what works well in the clinical area of uh, psychological outcome studies is then you can start to create treatment guidelines and those guidelines are called uh, like uh, evidence bases and you can then start to predicate your practice on these guidelines and what you found out what scientists have found out from uh, looking at outcome studies like we had done and create what's called and have an evidence-based practice or what's also called evidence-based medicine so again it's sort of like for me these combinations of these overlapping areas of technology and engineering and computers and math and science and programming as well as clinical work so it, um, uh, because I like to write it also has led to 
uh, publishing in a variety of different kinds of areas from engineering to clinical to outcomes, etc. And uh, even uh, some diplomatic areas I'll talk about as well too. Um, that was born from my work at the United Nations. I had an opportunity to work there for a year through the American Psychological Association. And again, this was all kind of formative and, and additive to what would become um, kind of what I'm leaning into today in retirement, which is a, a heavy aspect of volunteering. Uh, I've even kind of come as a byline to be known as the accidental humanitarian. I write for LinkedIn as an influencer and do a lot of what we'll talk about today if you want to do deeper dives and get more details in, into that. But what really got me into volunteering was being a volunteer. Um, that first start, I worked with Flying Doctors of America. Uh, our first, My first trip was with them to uh, this area, which again, maybe geographical pop quiz uh, if you want to guess where this is. It is the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, Ha Long Bay, Vietnam. Uh, that's where we started. This is our commute. You can see one of the um, physicians there in her scrubs taking some pictures. And we worked in a uh, over 100 year old hospital that had been built by the French. When I was working in clinical practice, I was a child and family psychologist. And I worked therefore with the pediatricians here. In that hospital, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have running water. We didn't even have glass in the windows. So I don't speak Vietnamese, but in the context of what I was doing was helping put together their formulary for the um, medications that had been donated to us and then when the physicians and, and nurses would need a compound put together or need to find out what medications they we had available that they could then uh, provide to the children I was kind of the, the Johnny on it fellow for that so it really has kind of for me been this wonderful uh, albeit long strange trip to where I'm at today and honestly uh, I'm obviously not uh, done with it yet. From there, uh, I was reading this really influential book uh, at this era, at this time uh, called The White Man's Burden, kind of an homage to um, uh, the uh, uh, aspect of looking at uh, global kinds of responsibilities, um, and William Easterly, you may know him, he's a, uh, an economist. And what I got from this book was really the uh, aspect of the power of the small project. Uh, oftentimes, large institutions, the UN, like where I had worked, as well as the World Health Organization or World Bank, etc., kind of get to a, a point of largesse in which then funding goes to, you know, help support people's salaries and large staffs and large overheads. And for me, with when I started my center, the idea was uh, very lean and mean. We're all volunteers at our center. We all uh, take no salaries. Etc. I'll talk more a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, uh, also, during this climb as an extracurricular, I liked uh, during this time I liked to climb, uh, and during this period um, I developed something in that aspect called Summits for Others. Again, as a as a nonprofit entity to help support the work of uh, 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 other NGOs and nonprofits like War Child. And in the process of doing that, um, I went to Kilimanjaro. Uh, I wanted to climb the seven summits. I got uh, three down and I'm probably gonna stop at that point. But in the process of doing that, I met this fellow, um, uh, Alois Uro, and he was a porter on our Tanzanian climb. And he was working as a porter to get funding to be able to go through seminary. And he and I kept touch uh, during that time, or pardon me, after that time. And uh, uh, pen pals, because this was the 90s, and now uh, we can communicate a little bit more clearly and quickly through emails. But uh, basically, um, that aspect of it, and we were sending funds over there, we're all just kind of, you know, me tapping friends and, and talking to people about, you know, how to build that. We've continued to work with them as a, as a project partner. Um, one of my mentors said, you need to make this, you know, a, a, an entity, not just fund everything yourself. Um, so we, with his help and his wife's help, who are both attorneys, helped uh, create our 501c3, our nonprofit, and um, have worked to build out our website and have a variety of different kinds of projects. And I'd be happy to come back or answer questions at, uh, you know, at the end if you want to put these uh, uh, in the um, comments box and you can, you know, check us out. We'll have all the links in the, in the uh, show notes I'll give you a reference to. But that's one of the main things I'm working on uh, right now. 
And the philosophy behind it at this point, we had a pivot again, which is a talk for another day, but it's just basically that uh, doing good work and trying to help others really shouldn't be so hard. So we're really kind of a, an accelerant to that and what we like to call open source humanitarian intervention. Everything on our website is free all the time, um, web, webinars, lectures, YouTube videos, podcasts, uh, books, book chapters, articles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no paywalls anywhere all, you know, at any point in time. So if you're interested in starting a 501c3, we can help you. If you're not interested in starting a 501c3 and maybe just want to help out with a certain kind of project, pet project of yours, uh, we can help you with that as well too. So be sure to, to reach out. So just a little plug. And then also, um, I'm very involved with um, uh, our podcast, Living a Life in Full, which is very resonant with this talk today. And a big fan of the podcast is a, not only a producer and, and host, but also as a consumer. One of the threads that runs through our podcast is that we have a, it's a magazine style show. So we have a variety of different kinds of uh, wonderful people with a variety of different kinds of expertise, but most all of them have some kind of humanitarian aspect. We've got land speed record racers. We've got um, folks that are, you know, hang out with the Dalai Lama. We've got astronauts. We've got diplomats, kind of you name it. We're all over the place. We're on about 35 different platforms. So please do um, uh, give, a, give us a listen and, and see what kind of topic you're interested in and start off there. So since the title of that is Living a Life in Full, so we're speaking of life in full, a little bit back to my Batman era. Um, I, at uh, age 13 in 1972, was um, looking through Life magazine, and I saw this article at the tail end of it. It was by a fellow, or about a fellow, named John Goddard, and he talked about living a life of no regrets. And one of the things that he wanted to do to be able to, to have a life like that, that he could look back on, was he, around the same age as me, which is kind of uh, interesting karma, uh, put together this checklist of stuff that he wanted to do. So, um, and he created, a, he, he used this as a model of um, uh, not just what I want to do, but also keeping track of what I, what he did, what he wanted to do and what he did. And I really liked that model rather than just sort of like, say, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z. Once I've done X, Y, Z, then it's off my list. Um, I, you know, was very inspired by this and wanted to create my own list. And over those, and I did. And over those ensuing years, my list kind of grew and grew. And I have it organized. Um, again, you can, if you want to take a look at it, it's in the show notes. Or if you're at the uh, live presentation of this, you had a chance to see it. But basically, I found that um, it was kind of neat to have the checklist of stuff that I had done for myself, just in the sense of, um, you know, my motivation would would, would um, weaken sometimes. And sometimes I just felt like, okay, I'm just going to give up on this project or this goal or this dream or whatever. Or feel, you know, just a little, I don't know, crestfallen or exhausted or there was some something. And I could look back and say, you know, kind of get a little motivation and a little, you know, goose to my uh, willpower in terms of getting back in the game. So um, my bias, the way that I like to do it is to have not only what I still want to do, which is a, like a blank in front of blank XYZ that I want to do, and then a check mark by the XYZ that I had done. I find that to be super helpful for me. But in, in terms of um, what you do, you know, experiment and play with it, see what, if you want to have a list, what that might look like. Um, my list got some new notoriety. Um, I lived for a number of years in uh, Chicago, and uh, it got picked up by the Chicago Tribune. One of the very cool side effects of this was that the um, uh, the reporter that did this was quite the journalist, and and Bill Hagman um, researched. Um, uh, the fellow that uh, had John Goddard that had started that first list that inspired me and put us in touch with each other and I had a chance to talk to John he's still was still living at that time and uh, we talked about things and it was just really kind of neat I I hope he felt good that his uh, article inspired you know myself and now I'm going out and hopefully inspiring others as well but uh, hopefully this article and, and other kinds of things in this presentation might you know give you some inspiration to do the same it also got picked up by men's journal and, and wound up in there and in uh, places like uh, Windy City Sports with, the, at the time, my 16-page to-do list, which has now uh, somewhat grown significantly since 2007. So, you know, enough about me and my list. Let's, let's start to talk about yours. 
I think, again, this is my bias, but I feel like there's some sort of magic or some sort of alchemy um, that happens when you write things down. It sort of takes the abstract to where you have to articulate them into words, into something that's a bit more concrete, a bit more actionable, um, you know, that there's more uh, tangible possibilities with what it is once we really start to, to go from some ba vague, maybe even fleeting thought to something that uh, gets written down as a goal or a to-do. So at this point in time, you know, you're probably watching this at home or someplace. Um, so you can hit pause, grab a pen and paper, and we can kind of get started. I want to give you some tools and techniques that you can try out and that you can consider and see what, what works well for you. The first thing I want you to do is just kind of blue sky it, you know, kind of inventory your dreams. My guess is you have gotten, you know, at some point in time, some desire, some goal, some dream of some something that you want to do. So, you know, just scribe that down, scribble that down, take a look and, and, and start to make a laundry list of those things. A next step, once you've done that, is to kind of estimate a time uh, that you would like to achieve them. Maybe start to associate a timeline with them. Let's say you want to run a race or you want to travel to Spain or there's certain kinds of things like that. You know, you can't do that tomorrow. Um, chances are, unless you're really fit or you've already got your, your tickets booked. But um, think about when you might want to do those because the, the getting up to that point may take some time, may take some planning. Maybe you want to travel to a place where you need a visa. Maybe you, um, you want to run that marathon and you need to, you know, get your mileage up, those kinds of things. And then work backwards from there like Stephen Covey talks about. And then from all this, you know, get all that down and then maybe start to prioritize, maybe pick what are the five most important that you want to do for the year or for next year and the next, again, whatever time period that might be. And then um, rank order and prioritize within those. And, you know, be realistic about it. I mean, again, I talked about blue sky, but, you know, it's not, you know, unless you're you're rich and you're going to hop on board with Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, you know, don't necessarily say, you know, that you're going to fly to the moon or, or you're going to, you know, go into orbit or something like that, again, unless you're a, a, a semi-retired astronaut. And don't, you know, obviously set yourself up for failure. Think about um, what are the things, even if they're things of like traveling to Spain or um, running that marathon, think about the stuff that might get in the way from uh, preventing or, or getting to that goal. And then what are the ways that might um, uh, help you deal with that? Let's say you have a, a chronic uh, knee issue or something like that. Well, maybe it's a different pair of shoes. Maybe it's talking to a, a sports medicine specialist or an orthopedic uh, specialist or a physical therapist to say, you know, is it my stride? Is it um, I go out too quick on, on, and up my mileage too much and get injured or whatever? So think about the things that maybe you've tried the goal and had to let it go in the past of what you might be able to do and seek outside help to be able to, um, to tweak and, and get that going. Um, and, you know, don't give up when you have a setback. Um, I'm going to give an example here in just a second of exercise and uh, diet, but uh, setbacks happen. Uh, COVID happens. If you had a plan to go to Spain two years ago, chances are you didn't go to Spain. The other thing is um, sometimes there's an inherent aspect of um, whatever that activity is, uh, is fun. Like for me, I really enjoy a sauna, so I don't need any other kind of secondary motivation to, to get me into the sauna. But um, sometimes uh, going out on runs or whatever aren't necessarily my thing. So I paired that with a podcast, uh, listening to somebody else's podcast, and I look forward to that. There's a certain podcast I only listen to when I'm running. So um, I don't spoil it and I don't dilute that and I get to, to pair those things. So it, it helps me uh, get out the door, get my shoes on and plug in my earbuds. Um, but, you know, again, if uh, external rewards, if that podcast wasn't enough or whatever, uh, then, you know, uh, maybe, um, you know, put goals together to support uh, uh, together, uh, to support each other. Sorry. Um, I refer to this as sort of like uh, stacking. Um, sometimes I refer to it like when I'm writing, like content stacking. I may try out an idea. I have to write for LinkedIn as an influencer. I might try out an idea uh, tossing it out there um, for uh, critique and people online, as you probably know, are very willing to criticize what gets posted um, online. And I take that criticism to heart and uh, see how I might recraft what my ideas are uh, before then I continue to work on it that then might wind up as something as a introduction for a book chapter or a project for um, a scientific journal article or something along those lines. So I really try to combine those things wherever they I can and it just uh, helps in productivity and, and I find them mutually uh, supportive of each other. 
If you need some ideas, uh, you may not, but uh, here's just some, some suggestions. Um, try and learn something new. I'm guessing you, by virtue of listening or watching this uh, video, or if you were in the audience for the learning in retirement, that's something that you're very involved in and something that you very much like. So um, a variety of ways to do that by YouTube videos, by coming to lectures, by podcasts, by books, uh, watching documentaries, etc. Think about building a creative muscle. Um, I went to a workshop where the fellow was a professional photographer and he said that his mother felt like she was never really a creative person. So she had a smartphone and he recommended that she take a, at least one photograph every day. And she did, and she would look back at those photographs and she'd say, well, this was pretty good. You know, maybe if the lighting was different or maybe if I framed it a little differently or maybe I could edit it and, you know, tweak out this, you know, hiccup that was in the lower corner. And she found that over time she enjoyed that, um, that her eye was better than what she maybe would have given herself credit for. So again, try those things out. <clears throat> maybe it's writing poetry. Maybe it's uh, being uh, experimenting in the kitchen. Uh, maybe it's, you know, picking up uh, painting or sketching or anything like that, whatever creative aspect and just, you know, play with it, see what works, rinse and repeat. If it's something you don't like, that's great. You probably learn something from it and can try something different. Be careful with this, uh, but I always like to say, you know, try maybe a, a fitness challenge or maybe a wild fitness challenge. Um, I just interviewed a guest for my show, Colin O'Brady, who has something called the 12 hour walk. Um, I have done uh, the Murph, uh, something called the Murph, which is the, the Murph challenge, the uh, 100 ton challenge, all sorts of weird kinds of things. I haven't, knock on wood, hurt myself with any of these things. But again, if you're interested in those, you can Google them or uh, look up some of the stuff that I've posted on it. But sometimes it's just kind of fun. Uh, you make uh, maybe a new set of folks that you wouldn't have necessarily if it's a if it's a combined kind of thing or if there's a team working together on it, but uh, it can be fun. And then just rev your brain, probably, <clears throat> excuse me, all these things will rev your brain, but whatever it might be, you know, read, read a, 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 a newspaper that you don't typically pick up, um, watch something that's, you know, kind of new and outside of what you're used to, you know, just kind of, you know, try that out, go to um, a newsstand and pick up a couple of magazines or even just thumb them there that maybe you've never opened up before that you might think have no interest to you. Uh, and they may not, you know, try, try different kinds of puzzles, et cetera, but just the idea of exposure to different kinds of things that uh, maybe is outside of our, you know, our, our typical um, consumption. Uh, I also like to talk about um, thinking about a road map. Um, you know, you saw my, my uh, uh, image of that when I was doing my bio, but think about um, where do you, uh, how do you get to where you want to go? Um, and along that process, um, there's going to be, I can guarantee you, no matter what it is, there's chances are going to be some detours uh, and it's not going to be a straight route. Um, you have choices. Maybe you want to take the scenic route. Maybe you want to take the highway. Some things may be dead ends and, and that's okay because there's still probably learning experiences. And, and likewise with, with speed bumps, not everything goes smoothly or always according to plan. And sometimes when you have your destination or have your journey, um, it's sometimes it is the destination of where it is you want to go. Sometimes it's the journey, the process of getting there. And sometimes it's actually both. It's a fun process to get from point A to B. And it's also maybe kind of cool and fun to be at, at point B. When you're making your roadmap, just some ideas, uh, choose the goals that you want to work towards. And again, whatever time period, depends on what they are, but maybe the next year, the balance of this year, whatever it might be. And personally, I like to choose goals in different categories, but that's just me. You might uh, might want to do it that way or not. If your roadmap for you is based strictly around work, let's say, or the things that you like to work on, then your categories might um, be the, the names of specific projects. You know, maybe you're a, a woodworker, or maybe you're a baker or whatever. So maybe there's certain kinds of recipes you want to try in the kitchen. Maybe there's certain kinds of new woods you want to do. Maybe there's certain kinds of new techniques that you want to try out, whatever those things might be. And if your roadmap does combine, combine work and non-work kinds of things, then you might want to think about different categories for those roadmaps like uh, relationships or health and wellness things like that again it's your roadmap so you get to make it kind of you know whatever it is that you want <clears throat> a key thing about your roadmap is that it should in my bias uh, answer three questions consider where you are now um, you know it, what's it going to take to be able to get uh, to where it is and is it going to be a short trip a uh, quick trip or is it going to be uh, something that takes a little bit more planning 
Uh, where is it that you are going with that is the ultimate goal. And again, it can be travel, of course, and just quite literal, or it could be something that, uh, you know, I want to uh, improve my health. I want to improve my longevity. I want to improve my current uh, functionality and future functionality. And what might you do along the way? What are some of the fun things, kind of what we talked about uh, earlier with those kinds of things? Some models for this, there's a bunch out there, so I'm just going to show you a couple. Um, this one, uh, one of the first steps with it is to just sort of identify and rank what your priorities might be. And these are just general categories. Sometimes they're very helpful. You just might use these whole cloth or you might want to tweak these a little bit for your needs. And evaluate how well um, your priorities align with your time. And that can be timeline, that can be time available, etc. And then think about what, again, might get in the way. What are the roadblocks? What are the things that, um, you know, might be problematic or, or might get in the way? Also with these things, you know, think about the why of it. What's what's your motivation behind it? Is that is it sincere? You know, is it is it going to be, you know, if, if it's something long lasting or is it just, you know, kind of a curiosity and itch that you want to scratch? Think about the what of your road model. What are the actions that you're going to take? Um, maybe it's uh, the actions are to get more uh, fit, to exercise more, to uh, eat better. And then how would you go about doing that? So these are more the tactics of it. So um, they, they, that might be, well, I'm gonna be more fit. Being more fit means I need to walk more or being more fit means I need to uh, not uh, do double desserts or something along those things. Maybe I need to shop more for more healthy kinds of things when I go to the grocery store. And then again, the when. Uh, certain kinds of things about healthy eating could be, you know, um, tomorrow, today, uh, my next meal kind of a thing. Or it might be travel and you, like I said, need to get that visa or it might be something that's uh, a little bit more long range, long term type of thing. There's also something called the Ikigai model. Um, it's Japanese, and I really, really like this. Um, it's the, the, it, the translation basically is uh, your reason for being. And I, I just, maybe I'm just graphically, you know, nerdy about these kinds of things. But just to take a look at this, I, we won't spend hours on it. But, um, uh, you know, if you look in the upper right hand corner, it says, you know, sort of what gives you a delight and fullness, but isn't necessarily your job. So thinking about what the world needs and what it is that you love, those two combine in a Venn diagram to your mission. And, you know, there may be uh, overlaps as you get to the icky guy part of it, you know, when you start to, um, uh, you know, see that that might might overlap with vocation. Uh, maybe you, uh, the world needs um, physicians and you're on a mission to do um, pediatric, pediatrics and that is your vocation. So you can obviously have those things overlap, but they don't necessarily always do. They don't necessarily have to, but sort of like the ideal life is where you can give what the world needs, what you can get paid for, what you're good at and what you love is really experiencing your reason for being. And that's smack dab in the middle with the bullseye of um, icky guy. So I just really sort of like this. And it's maybe a way to kind of even take a look at where are you now on this kind of a, of a map of a model and what kinds of things might you um, winnow down a little bit and what kinds of things might you uh, add to. More tools and techniques. Um, just as a psychologist, I'm sort of obliged to say these kinds of psychological things. Just had to need to take a sip of coffee here. Um, it's hard not to do something. If I say, don't think of an elephant, the first thing that pops into mind is an elephant. So maybe frame things in the more positive vernacular. So instead of saying, I'm just gonna use this as an example. Um, instead of saying, you know, I want to lose weight, Maybe think about the things that you get. Uh, you get to gain strength as you start to have that weight loss. Uh, you probably uh, can, in that process, become more flexible. Uh, you, you know, as a, you want to be more healthy. Uh, you want to have more energy. So these are all things that you can start to to, to um, to have as being additive that you can gain, that you can become, that you can be part of, you know, being healthy and having more energy. Other kinds of things are something, again, back to psychology called successive approximations or shaping our behaviors. And it's sort of like different kinds of steps and also kind of gauging your expectations in an appropriate kind of way. 
if you think, you know, okay, I'm going to start exercising more in that process to losing weight. Oh my gosh, I'm sore. Well, expect that. Hooray. Good for you. Probably a good workout. Don't get injured that you don't, you don't work out to get injured and hopefully that won't happen, but, um, expect to get sore. That's a good sign. You did, you had a good workout. And, you know, my wife and I and, and family, um, joke about that, that, you know, oh, I'm achy or I'm sore, but it's a good sore, you know, because we know that it's, you know, that you can feel that muscle group that you worked out. Uh, not hopefully that it's a blister or something like that. Um, and expect, you know, if you're restricting calories and not having that second dessert, that you might get hungry every now and then. But you know what? You always get hungry. We always get hungry. We also always have um, hunger pains. And you may have cravings. That wonderful dessert that um, that you maybe always doubled down on, maybe you've cut out or cut back on. So you may crave that. Well, of course you are. That's just natural. So think about maybe as an approach to that, not just accepting that that's a natural kind of thing, but also there's, um, just Google it, there's a bunch out there, if you do eat this, not that, where you can feel very satisfied with a more healthy alternative to something. And you may plateau. Um, oftentimes the phenomenon of um, getting uh, into exercise and restricting calories, um, you may, you know, you will have generally a, a you know, some a very motivating weight loss right at the beginning. Uh, and you may plateau, and that's okay, because that's how our bodies work. We adapt. Um, the uh, initial uh, weight loss uh, kinds of things may be maybe the more su superficial kinds of, um, uh, of fat that we've lost, and now it's time to, you know, uh, make these uh, healthy habits, a ha healthy, healthy activities, a healthy habit that we start to do them all the time, not just uh, episodically or that we don't, you know, it's, you know, you might backslide here and there, but once you backslide, don't let that become an avalanche. Then just, you know, get back on the horse and engage and get going with it. And again, I always say, you know, I've given you all these models and roadmaps and stuff, experiment, 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 you know, figure out really what works for you. Um, and then learn how to make it kind of a, a part of your life. Um, like, let's say, you know, if being fit is part of who you are, then having an exercise routine that you do 90% of the time is kind of part of who you are. Going for that walk every morning or evening or whatever is part of who you are. And that's that's what you do. And that makes you say, you know, and, and I am a more fit person or I'm a more well-traveled person or I'm a more literate person, again, depending on what your goals are. Um, it's, and again, sometimes you may need help. It's, a lot of this stuff isn't intuitive. If it was easy, we wouldn't need to be doing it necessarily. So um, maybe getting help is coming to one of these classes. Maybe getting help is going to the internet, maybe going to the library, maybe talking to friends, maybe getting involved in a running group or a, a Weight Watchers group or something like that. Again, I'm just using weight as an example. And then maybe get a buddy uh, or a partner. Um, some people call this a... Um, like having a uh, accountability partner. Uh, there's actually accountability apps that uh, you can download that will be reminders or prompts. I do time-restricted eating and I have an app that I love called Zero, and it keeps track of it and it motivates me. I got a free t-shirt the other day. So, you know, it's it's nerdy, it's silly, but it's fun um, and I like it and it's it certainly helps. Some other kinds of things uh, that a partner can be help with, helpful with, is that they can support you in in those behavioral change. They can encourage you to, you know, walk away from the table when it's time for that second dessert or whatever. Uh, they can help you with maybe kind of spotting some of your blind spots or weaknesses of the kinds of things that uh, maybe you wouldn't intuitively be able to identify for yourself. Um, they can help you when you do hit those hiccups, uh, you do have that backslide or whatever. And they can also help. They can help you with you know the, those baby steps. If you decide that you want to become more athletic, you don't just you know become a, a you know a, get involved in Olympic level training kinds of things. You you know you people crawl and then walk and then run. So you know take those initial steps and, and maybe have that encouragement during those steps and those other kinds of things that that support that. And then. <clears throat> look at uh, you know identifying whatever those other kinds of uh, social su social supports might be for you and goals can be uh, another model for this can be what's called smart that uh, it's a nice acronym for that they can be specific or should be specific they're not too vague they're measurable you can see what the difference is they're achievable you don't do something that's outside of your ability they're relevant it's something that makes sense and there's a timeline to it that uh, you know you know kind of when you hit it weight might be a little different but the timeline for that might be you know hitting your ideal weight and then staying within a you know five pound uh, range of it for the balance of your life example. 
You might be saying to yourself, hey man, thanks, that's all cool, but I don't like setting goals. There's just too many unexpected variables. You can't predict the future, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I get it. You know, yes, that's absolutely true. Things do change. They ch can change for uh, both, you know, beneficial kinds of ways and, and bad ways. Um, so the idea of having your plan and having your roadmap um, is that it's not a strict schedule you have to live by. Just like the literal road map, you know, there may be road construction and detours that slow you down or take you in a slightly different direction. You know, that's, that's fine, but um, I always feel like it's better to have a direction and go in it and then feel free to change your mind and, and take that off ramp and, and go, you know, take a look, uh, you know, take the scenic route rather than the fast route or there's something interesting to, to get involved with or you, maybe you decide, you know, maybe getting to that point isn't as important as it was and because you enjoyed in the process of getting to where you were heading uh, to something that's maybe even better. So for me also, I like to combine goal setting and annual reviews. I think they're really about um, changing things rather than waiting for change to like sort of happen to you and, and, and you know, fall on you and, and just kind of show up one day. And what I call, I kind of refer to it as avoiding the pox. I'll talk about um, the pox in, in our final slides. So you might say, okay, great. Okay, I'll try the goals or whatever, but what's this about an annual review? Well, it's again kind of back into my goal setting practice that you can adopt or adapt and, and play with and see if it makes sense for you. But again, not having vague or non-measurable goals. Um, a lot of people might say, you know, I want to be happier. Well, that's great. You know, I want to make more money. Well, that's fine. But um, what are the things that are going to make you happier? And how can you start uh, insinuating those into your day in, day out uh, life? Or I want to make more money. Okay, great. Um, how are you going to do that? Um, do you need to get a new job? Do you need to get a raise? Do you need to take a second job? What are the, and then what does it take to be able to get that raise or to get that promotion or et cetera? So this process really requires that each goal, again, needs to be measurable and specific. So the more money, well, you know, is, is the money, uh, just to use that as an example, I want to make $2,000 more a year. Well, is that a reasonable raise that you could get? If it is, then it's probably means your goal should be getting that promotion and getting that raise. If it's not going to be a possibility and you're topped out, then maybe the goal becomes uh, seeking a new job or brushing up on some new skills and bringing that to your work. Um, a rigid plan, uh, you know, it, it's just... Um, you, you don't have to live with it, you know, if, if you hate it. <laughs> um, you can always change it. It, does, it should not be a rigid plan. Uh, again, that roadmap with the uh, metaphor with all the kinds of changes you might want to do. And if you're the one that's making it, um, you shouldn't hate it. Um, you, you should feel totally carte blanche to be able to change it any which way that you want. And again, I'm not a super fan of um, New Year's resolutions. Um, Sometimes that's just simply not a good time of the year to do that. I would imagine there's probably a scientific study out there that most of them are broken uh, by the 10th. Um, so I really, I like to have a plan of action instead. And if you're interested in hearing or reading more about uh, what I called revolution over resolutions, uh, I wrote that up on LinkedIn and um, also have a podcast on it. If you want to listen to it. Another way to think about this, maybe this is just a tad bit uh, morbid, but um, Kevin Kelly is a guy who uh, I'm a big fanboy of. Uh, Kevin, if you don't know of him, has just done a variety of amazing things. Google him. He's really a cool guy. He's got a lot of free stuff out there, too, that you can take a look at. But Kevin's um, one of the co-founders of Wired Magazine, which I'm a subscriber to for years. Um, and he was actually the very first guest of uh, This American Life, uh, which I think is probably still findable uh, online if you want to listen to that. And one of the things he talked about when he was very young, he kind of thought, you know, what would he do if he only had six months to live? What would be on that, you know, six month bucket list of kind of things? And that kind of stayed with him over the course of the balance of his life. Uh, I think he's pushing late 60s at this point, maybe 70 by now. But he did this thing. He did um, the, you know, with his uh, biological DNA aspects of his family and and how long people lived in his family, his lifestyle, his health issues and things like that. And he figured out sort of how many years he has left and he actually created a count. And so he thought, OK, I'm going to probably live to age X. And then he has a countdown uh, clock on his computer desktop that says, you know, whatever today is, you know, how many more days till that expected uh, date of, of a natural death, which I wouldn't recommend that. And I don't do that. But, um, you know, that's 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 Stuart Brand's way of doing it. 
or pardon me, of uh, Kevin Kelly. So speaking of Stuart Brand, they're pals. That's him on the right. Um, Stuart Brand is also an amazing guy that I'm a big fan of. I think there's a documentary now out about him or just about out in his life. And he's one of the few guys that I think was probably a, a Marine as well as a, um, a hippie. And I think the hippie came after being a Marine. Um, he wrote the or created the Whole Earth Catalog. He created, um, he wrote um, How Buildings Learn. And he's just into so many different kinds of areas. He's kind of the, the polymath's polymath. And one of the things that um, uh, uh, Kevin uh, talked about with Stuart Brand was that um, Stuart says that anything kind of worth doing, bigger projects, not small kinds of things, are probably going to take about five years. You're going to write a screenplay, you're going to produce a movie, you're going to write a book, you're going to uh, do a startup, etc. Chances are to do it well, it's going to take about five years. So you then can kind of work backwards to say, well, I'm age X and between now and maybe how many more years I have left, how many clusters of five years do I have with that? So I can you know, participate in two more projects. So I'm going to be very specific and very picky about what those projects are. It's sort of like what a friend of mine, Derek Sievers, talks about. If when someone asks you to do something, be, you know, would you be, you know, part of this project or whatever, to say it's either a hell yes or it's no. That you really, you know, at this point in our lives, let's be honest, you know, we, we, it's, it's not, uh, uh, an infinite lifespan left. So the the amount of time, the quality of work, the level of work, and what the, that work might be, whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily mean to be paid. It could be you know creative, whatever. Uh, think about that, and then be able to use that as a filter for what it is you want to do and what you want to do next. So um, getting towards the tail end of our talk, um, do you need some inspiration? Um, I'll give you a, a couple of quick examples, and these are from um, some of the books that I've written. I did a three-book uh, series, three-volume series called The New Humanitarians, and this really was born out of a, scratching my own itch, which most of my stuff is, which I hope is fine. I think it's fine. I recommend it. Um, and that was when I was in the process of starting my nonprofit, um, I was working with a variety of other people through World Economic Forum that had started their nonprofits. And I was just sort of like they were they were ahead of me and they were really doing well. And it was really cool and clever and creative of how they did it. And I wasn't really sure how they did it. You know, how did they start? So I tapped those folks. Um, I also then went out to other organizations that I respect, like the um, uh, Doctors Without Borders and Amnesty International, et cetera. Some of the large name brands like that, and then some of the smaller, newer ones that were out there and devoted each chapter of, um, of the, these books, depending on what the topic was, education or global health, et cetera, um, to the, those organizations. So there's a chapter, standalone chapter on Doctors Without Borders, a standalone chapter on Southern Poverty Law Center, et cetera, and interviewed either the current CEOs of those or the founders of those and just kind of asked them the questions, you know, where, what would you do differently? What, what went wrong? What were the problems? What went well? You know, so I could learn from that, but then it's also like if other interested readers are are uh, wanting to do similar kinds of work, that they could you know grab one of these books to pick upon their topical interest, and be able to learn how these groups did it as well too. So. I also had the opportunity to make some new friends since uh, this was <clears throat> not all just places and people that I had uh, worked with. So let me just give you a highlight reel of about three. Uh, this is Ethan Zuckerman. Ethan is an amazing guy. Uh, a lot of uh, Ivy in his background in terms of um, where he's taught and where he's been. But uh, one of the things he did was create something called Geek Core. And Geek Core is different than Geek Squad. It has nothing to do with Best Buy or anything like that. But basically, and, and Ethan's also got a wicked sense of humor. I'll tell you, when we were putting the images together and stuff for the book, I said, hey, man, could you send me some pictures? And he sent me this. And he said, yeah, here I am. I, I forget where he is. I think maybe Ghana in this. And he said, um, I'm the one on the right. So a uh, funny guy, sharp guy. And what his what Geek Corpse did when it started was um, it met a, a need. And that need was there's a number of organizations and companies, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, et cetera, Dell, that um, will donate a certain number of their computers, Apple, to um, uh, areas, developing uh, countries and areas and with developing education needs and things like that companies uh, small businesses and stuff um, in developing company and developing countries 
And that's great. I totally support that. There's nothing in the world wrong with that. But the problem became when they would get these computers, um, they wouldn't necessarily know how to properly go through the setup. It was confusing. I can tell you, I have been there. How many, you know, think about yourself. How many times have you on, you know, an 800 number and tech support to be able to figure out how you, to get your pre printer to connect to your computer or to get your monitor to work? Or, you know, is this an HDMI cord or USB or how does this and that work? It's not also always easy or uh, intuitive, especially if English isn't your first language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Geek Corp comes in and about a week after the hardware has wound up wherever the hardware is going, they come in and they set up everything because there isn't an 800 number that if you're in Zimbabwe or, or Ghana that you can easily call up to say, hey, you know, I, my uh, uh, Bluetooth connection between my monitor and my computer doesn't seem to work. So uh, Geek Corp comes in and makes sure that all those wonderfully donated pieces of equipment all communicate properly together and well with one another and they do it for free. Um, Bill Rosenblatt, he was, is a uh, anesthesiologist at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital, um, and he, in the process of being an anesthesiologist, spent most of his time, uh, in, spends most of his time in uh, operating rooms. And the downside is he, I think, created the world's worst acronym for a uh, nonprofit called it's Remedy, which is a great name. But uh, he really kind of played uh, loose with how he got to that. So it stands for Recovered Medical Equipment for the Developing World. And I don't know how the Y got to be world, but there it is. Um, the idea was when he was uh, in the OR, he would see someone coming in for a procedure. Um, there would be a kit of materials and it would be, you know, um, uh, you know, germ free and, and sanitized, so to speak. And they would open that kit up to do whatever the procedure was and they would use maybe, you know, a, a third of the tools that were inside that. <clears throat> So when you open up one of these kits, you always want to have, you know, to, to oversupply things in case something, you know, was needed that wasn't, uh, you know, seen. If someone drops a scalpel, they need immediately another scalpel, not to go have to rummage to, you know, have supply bring you another kit. So um, he saw the number of these medical instruments that were just never used. And what would happen with that is that they would then uh, be thrown away. And if you're familiar with medical waste, uh, even an untouched to a human being piece of medical equipment from the operating room is considered medical waste. And medical waste has to go through a whole other set of disposal. You don't just put it in your trash because that same medical waste might have uh, you know, contagions in it, it might have tainted blood, it might have, you know, God knows what in it. So um, a lot of times that is uh, burnt. Um, a lot of times that is put into certain kinds of places that don't wind up in traditional landfills, thank goodness, but still, you know, in a different kind of landfill, which isn't great for the environment, etc. So it, it was just sort of a cascading set of problems. Bill felt this waste is bad. Bill felt we're creating uh, atrogenically all these um, environmental problems of, of waste disposal and air pollution if it gets burned, et cetera. And there's a variety of um, uh, other ORs throughout the world that could really benefit from having this equipment because they don't have it. So he worked with, works, I keep saying past tense, sorry, works with, <clears throat> started off with and continues to work with colleagues in Nicaragua. And he um, gets the uh, unused medical equipment and gets it repackaged and categorized and has a group of medical students or uh, whoever that cares to volunteer organize that. That's what you see in the top part of this slide, getting everything organized. They very nicely catalog it and box it. And you see that kind of in the middle slide of Bill there with an assistant. And then it goes off to uh, Nicaragua. Uh, and that's what you see in that lower slide. Um, all that's great, but it's not easy. One of the other things Bill had to do was get the law changed. There are rules. You can't just say, just because I'm at the hospital, I get to take all this stuff and ship it to Nicaragua. You cannot do that. So he actually had to get the laws changed to have exceptions for these kinds of circumstances. So Bill came in, saw this problem, had the law changed, created, uh, got volunteers to help organize this stuff, grew it from his garage to getting volunteer or donated warehouse space to be able to do that and then donated shipping. And at the last time Bill and I talked, which which was a while back, but even then, so maybe it's grown from them, he said he felt like Remedy had provided probably or was in the midst of providing about 80 percent of um, non-durable medical equipment uh, to Nicaraguan um, hospital ORs, which I found just amazing and, and uh, just tip of the hat to Bill of being able to kind of have come up with one organization that could provide you know such a variety of different kinds of 
solutions. And finally, you know, again, sorry, I've probably been leaning a little too heavy into healthcare, but uh, that's kind of what I know the, the most and the best. Uh, Marie Charles. Um, Marie's a trained physician from the Netherlands. And one of the things that oftentimes, even myself, with like going over and working with flying doctors, is that there can be people that need um, medical equipment, like we just saw with Remedy and Bill, but um, they might get their equipment, they might get their tech set up by Ethan, and um, have volunteers coming in from flying doctors, et cetera. But um, one of the things we did, and, and one of the things my center does, is help and create training programs so they can be self-sustaining medical and not always require uh, people from other countries to come in to be able to provide the services. And one of the things that Marie saw with this is that that's great. You can have equipment, you can have supplies, you can have training, but um, you need organization too. So if you're, you know, if you've got in the developing world have a, um, a hospital or a clinic even, um, you need to be able to understand the processes of medical records, even if they're maybe not electronic, just you know, paper medical records, or supply and sourcing or formulary with your pharmacy, et cetera. All the different kinds of nuts and bolts and bits and pieces and staffing and everything else that goes into the proper and, and successful functioning, sustainable functioning of uh, clinics or of practices or of hospital settings or hospital systems. So <clears throat> she comes in with her nonprofit called Global Medic, Medic Force. And she teaches people that and she helps get uh, plans and programs and systems and processes in place to be able to properly utilize all that kind of equipment, almost kind of like what Ethan does with the, the tech, but helps uh, organizations or helps uh, entities, governments, et cetera, be able to be sustainable in the donated equipment and the trained services that they then have, which again, was just one of those things where um, she saw that problem and she came in developed a, a solution for it. And that's really kind of a common thread throughout these three examples and throughout really every uh, chapter in those three books of every NGO that we looked at. So I'd recommend that for you as well too, um, back to the humane and uh, humanitarian and volunteer aspects of these, that there's probably, if, you're, if you have the interest and gumption of um, being able to see that there's some kind of problem that maybe you can be a, a, a help and a solution to with it. I really feel like this is something that all of us can do it at whatever level. They don't have to be starting NGOs. They don't have to be global in some other country, but uh, there's probably a lot that we can do in our own backyard. And just to, to kind of reflect that, that Mother Teresa once said, if you can't feed uh, 100, then feed just one. You know, again, you don't have to go in and have uh, create systemic change. You can just, you know, help, help your neighbor. And sometimes you can at least solve part of the problem. It's not the, a huge problem. So back to my friend Alois, there he is in a, a snappy plaid shirt in Tanzania. And uh, we've continued to work together with him and build things out. We've now been able to found a kindergarten there for the orphans that he works with. Um, he is now chaplain at two hospitals there, etc. And we um, help support and provide um, uh, training materials and educational materials and uh, consult on projects. Um, we also um, do all of our, just with the majority of our fundraising uh, goes to support the work that they have. And we never tell them what our dollars need to be spent for uh, over there. So one year um, they had just a really bad malarial outbreak. And again, I know everybody knows that treated bed nets is probably the best way to avoid getting malaria. They did not have treated bed nets and people get malaria sometimes in spite of treated bed nets and we were working with the the, the downstream effect of, of um, people getting malaria the, the horse was already out of the barn so to speak so we needed to treat them uh, yes prevention is always better and more economical but sometimes you still need to treat so we provided funding uh, they sourced all of their own materials and in the process of doing that we went through a cohort of around uh, 4100 people uh, went through successful treatments and uh, did not die of malaria which can be a death sentence especially in developing areas and when we averaged out the cost of what it was to buy in-country materials and provide those services etc it wound up being 73 cents a life for that treatment protocol and it just really kind of blew me away again if you want to see the details of that i wrote it up um, on linkedin and you can get a link to that article um, other areas where you can be of help maybe you're not quite sure where um, i wrote this up it's also on linkedin uh, we called it 52 ways to change the world so 
52 is kind of a resonant number. There's 52 weeks in a year. There's 52 cards in a deck. So I made a card deck that you can uh, download um, for free, of course. Um, and they're all different kinds of areas. So you can kind of, you know, eyeball these, you know, how do I become a role model? How to inspire others? How to make a legacy? How to um, uh, promote peace, etc. Depending on whatever it is that might be of interest to you, and not all things might be, but who knows? And you can kind of take that, shuffle the deck, and see what the top card is. On the flip side of the card, it'll tell you what a little few statistics about whatever that topic is, and some other uh, nonprofits that are that I vetted that are working in those areas that you can get involved with at whatever level. You can be a volunteer, you can uh, volunteer your your, your uh, intellect, your time, your treasure, etc whatever those things might be, if you need to find out and think about those kinds of things as, as well. So it's kind of fun. It was a fun project to do. So, um, you know, check that out or, or ask me for a link or just Google it. Um, I also recently had um, a fellow on, uh, Charlie Bressler. Uh, here he is. Uh, the fellow you see in full shot is uh, Peter Singer. And Peter Singer uh, started a, um, or wrote a book called uh, The Life You Can Save. He's a, a philosopher. And Charlie really took that to heart uh, one time when he was on vacation. He read the, the book and got in touch with Peter. And they collaborated together to create an organization, a nonprofit um, called The Life You Can Save.org, which you can take a look at or listen to our podcast or read my write up on it if you want to learn more about them, I would highly recommend it. And then their aspect is what's called effective altruism. Uh, you can get a copy, the 10th uh, anniversary edition of Peter's book, The Life You Can Save. I highly recommend it. If you're into audiobooks, you can go to their website um, and download it as an audiobook. They've got some cool people like Kristen Bell and Stephen Fry and other notables, Paul Simon, um, do each uh, variety of chapters in the book, which is really cool to have them read to you. Um, you can download immediately a uh, e-version of it or a PDF of it, or you can put in your physical address and you can get um, a, a hard copy uh, book sent to you, which is really kind of cool and, and very generous of them for to to totally nothing. I don't even pay, you know, I don't even think you pay postage or anything. So it's it's very, very nice. You could buy it on Amazon if you want to pay for it, but uh, whatever whatever you, whatever you fits your, your uh, circumstance. But I highly recommend them and this whole concept of um, uh, effective uh, altruism. And part of the, the kind of maybe the headline of that is that um, our funding, if you want to donate dollars, uh, can go much further in developing areas um, than probably any place else in the world. And he makes a wonderful philosophic and economic argument for that. So got to end with the pop quiz. Um, let's uh, take, you take a look at this, Ferris. Uh, anyone, anyone can you answer this question? Who is this? This is hard for me to do since I'm doing it as a webinar and I can't hear anybody. But um, the right answer is Roger Bannister. Yes, for all of those that you that said Roger Bannister, that is correct. Uh, does anyone want to go for extra points, extra credit? Uh, anybody? Anybody? Mr. Bueller? How, uh, why he's famous or why I'm showing this shot? The reason is he was the first person to um, uh, break the four minute mile barrier uh, in, in uh, running. Um, prior to him doing that, there were a number of peer reviewed scientific journals on exercise physiology, athletics, sports medicine, etc., that said it can't be done. The human body cannot run that fast. It cannot do uh, run a mile in within uh, under four minutes, um, which is just amazing. I'm a runner. I'm not a fast runner. Uh, I am tickled uh, to be able to run. I would never imagine coming even close to um, to that. Uh, so it's just a you know, deep respect for that ability and to do it back in that level and that equipment back then in those days. But uh, I'll tell you, um, you want to think, you want to know what I think is even cooler? That and just a month later, um, this uh, uh, John Landy Ouse shaved almost two seconds off Bannister's time, which again, I think is amazing. Just, just uh, you know, a little over a month later, but you know what? Over the course of the following few years, 19 others ran sub four minute miles, 19 folks. So, you know, you could say, you know, obviously all these folks are runners to begin with, et cetera, but you could say for all of humanity, as far as we know, no one had ever broken that four minute mile. But once someone did, over the course of two years later, 19 more people ran sub fours. 
And I don't think it's because they all went out and got the Roger Bannister model of whatever you know track shoe it was, or they all adopted the Roger Bannister model of nutrition and diet, or got the special supplement or anything like that. I tend to think, again, I'm a psychologist, so uh, I tend to think that maybe what took so long was the fact that uh, folks have limiting beliefs. We all do, I do. Um, and in the context of those limiting beliefs, um, Sometimes it comes from others. Um, you know, others say, oh, you can never do that. You can never, I, and again, in the context of, of age, there is a, a person that uh, had been a journalist for a number of years. She said uh, uh, she worked a lot in the mental health area in terms of journalism, not in terms of practice, and she decided she wanted to go back to graduate school and get her PhD in psychology and become a psychologist. And her friends, you know, heard this and they said, you know, you're going to be 45 years old by the time you graduate. And she said, you know what? I'm gonna be 45 years old anyway. So why not change and get into a profession that I have an interest in and, and do that? So that can be, you know, even though your friends, et cetera, you know, and we've probably all experienced this as well. Sometimes there's, oh, you can never do that, Chris. You know, oh yeah, that's, that's just, you know, don't be ridiculous. You know, don't set yourself up for disappointment. So sometimes those limiting beliefs can come from others. And sometimes we adopt that. Sometimes that becomes part of our own fabric and we kind of, we limit ourselves. So it's sort of like I would challenge that um, maybe some of those 19 others had limiting beliefs that, yeah, I've read the journals, I've heard every the coaches, you know, everyone says the sub four minute mile is not a possibility until, you know, that black swan day when um, Bannister did it. And then all of a sudden it became a possibility. And then it became maybe an even more uh, reachable kind of goal because it was no, people weren't any longer limiting themselves. I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the pox. Um, so I think sometimes this limiting belief co-occurs with something I call the pox of the entils. So maybe the flip side of that, uh, that coin is that a lot of us kind of have this mental model of we're going to wait until. Now again, sometimes that's realistic, but sometimes it's not. So in the unrealistic side of it, sometimes we might say to ourselves, well, I'm going to wait until I graduate. I'm going to wait until I get my first job. I'm going to wait until I get into graduate school. I'm going to wait until I get out of graduate school. I'm going to wait until, for me as a psychologist, until I get my license. I'm going to wait until um, I retire. I'm going to wait until I get this amount of money. I'm going to wait until, until, until. And then we get to an age, because we'll continue to age, and these untils hopefully won't continue, but if they do, we might get to this point where it's too late. It literally is too late. It's not the issue of I'm 40, I'll be 45 anyway. There's certain kinds of things, back to our Stuart Brand example, that it's just, you know, that five-year chunk has set sail. We don't have those chunks anymore. And then we start to look back, not in regrets of what we did, but in regrets of what we didn't. So right now, probably, hopefully, wherever you are in your life, you can start to think about what we've talked about today or thought about today together and avoiding what, what I call future forward regrets. What do I need to place into motion today? What do I need to get down and, and get going with uh, to be able to avoid any of those future forward regrets? So to wrap up, Advice is hard. This is, I've talked to you about what I've read, about what I've done, about what I've experienced and kind of, you know, what's worked for me. I probably should talk about maybe other things. It's a talk for another day about what hasn't worked. But these are the things that work for me. And my point is, is that they may work for you. They may not work for you. Parts may work for you. I have found that some stuff that worked 10 years ago when I was a different age and different point in my life don't work so well today. So I need to adapt and um, figure out kind of like what's going to work to get this project done or what's going to work in this kind of life circumstance. And minimalists, I think, give maybe some nice advice about how to be successful uh, through a fairly simple equation. They suggest that happiness plus constant improvement plus contributing to others and being, you know, that's I'm going to be biased to liking that is what equals success and what equals satisfaction. So, you know, think about that in the course of setting up your goals, the kinds of things that you want to be doing and, you know, kind of what will happen in those next chapters. 
there really isn't a fixed set of rules. There's not necessarily my path is my path. It may be parts of it may be good for you and your roadmap, et cetera. Um, but there really is no specific, you know, guaranteed way um, of, you know, what's going to work. So really do, you know, rinse and repeat of what works for you, adopt and adapt and augment in the different kinds of areas, experiment when something, um, you know, with something, if it's new and if it doesn't work, then let that go and see what you can do different. And again, obviously, I'm a big fan of tools. I really feel like a lot is about whatever we talked about today is really about tools and, and learning. So uh, I put a variety of things together on my website, uh, a life living or pardon me, a life in full .org. Uh, This page is a screenshot from that. I got a, it uh, links to a variety of different kinds of tools and resources there. Um, I also am a big uh, power user of a, a website called issue, I-S-S-U-U dot uh, com. Uh, and I have a number of what's called stacks. So there's these little libraries and things. And all of today's talk um, is a PDF and available for you to read at your leisure. If you want to see some of the slides again or pull something off some of the slides, a URL or something, they are freely available to you right this second. I posted it on an issue before I've recorded this webinar. Um, and then I also have a um, uh, website, or pardon me, a group page on Facebook uh, called A Life in Full, big surprise. Uh, come join there. Uh, I post every Sunday morning. I have a Sunday morning uh, breakfast club, as I call it. So um, uh, all sorts of interesting things around this whole kind of within the rubric of um, uh, living a life in full and links and things that you might find of interest. And then back to this, I also have um, our notes, a uh, detailed set of show notes for stuff that just was too good to not tell you about, but too much to put into a PowerPoint. So uh, please do come there, check, you'll see, you'll see this, um, this um, uh, set of notes, et cetera, and go to uh, YouTube and look at our channel. Um, you can see the URL there to be able to see this and a variety of our podcasts and other lectures and webinars. So it really is my hope that uh, you can use what we talked about today to create the best year of your life and perhaps to help um, others' lives as well. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Do keep in touch. Here's my personal uh, email address. And I'd like you to go do great things. Since this is a webinar, it's not live. It's being recorded. Um, I can't field a q and I can in the comments section or if you want to email me if you're if you want to keep it private and not make them public. But uh, I would suggest make them public um, because I'm guessing if you have a question, other people may have that same question and be a little shy about it. So post your question in the comments. I'll answer the question in the comments um, and everybody can kind of learn and grow from that. So again, I really appreciate your time today. Um, do feel free to keep in touch, uh, subscribe to anything that I have out there that uh, might be of interest. And uh, thanks for your time. And I look forward to hearing what you're up to and for you to live your life in full. Take care. This is Chris Stout.